go for the for the people that are online right now. I want to welcome you all to a MS Views and News program. This one is called A Compass to MS Care. All right, and me, well, me. My name is Stuart Schlossman. For those that do not know, and I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. All right, I'm also an MS patient, which makes this whole thing very interesting. Since we began back in where did we begin? We began back in well, many years ago. I can't count back at this point in time, all right? I'm not in that mindset. But anyway, tonight we have a sponsor of tonight's program. It's Genentech, and I want everybody to thank Genentech. So let's say thank you, Genentech. Yay, round of applause, okay? Awesome, thank you. All right, so then tonight we're going to be doing this event with, with Mitzi Williams. Mitzi Williams is an MS neurologist. I do not have her profile in front of me right now to read anything to you. But just know, I mean, if you've been on our events in the past, you know what an awesome doctor she is, and she's got an awesome conversation. And she is from the Joy Wellness Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I believe that she's only been doing the Joy Wellness Center for less than a year now. And I hear it's booming. So let's just let Mitzi take it away with the questions, with the topics. You can see it on the screen right now. And I'll be back in about 35 minutes, and we'll start the Q&A, okay? Okay, guys, I am so excited to be here with my MS Views and News family um, to talk about a little bit of a different topic tonight about access and care. We'll also touch a little bit on clinical trials. And as you know, Stuart's programs are always action packed. So we've got a lot of ground to cover in a very short period of time. So we'll go ahead and just get right into the presentation. First, I wanna start by kind of framing what does underserved population mean? Oftentimes when underserved come to mind, um, there may be a visual that comes to mind, but when we talk specifically about MS, there are many different groups of people or several different groups of people that may be considered underserved. And I actually was uh, very fortunate to be the guest editor of, an, uh, of one of our medical journals, Practical Neurology, where we talked about underserved populations. And these were some of the groups that we include. So certainly we often think of ethnic minority populations, especially here in the United States. States. We think of Black people or people of African descent. We think of the Hispanic Latino community as well as Asian and Native American communities. But also rural communities can be underserved, especially when they don't have access to a neurologist or an MS specialist. And there are many pockets of the country where there almost is like a neurology desert. Uh, and then there's some cities like Atlanta, where I live, where there may be four or five MS centers um, versus other areas of the country where there are none for miles and miles. Um, other populations that could be considered underserved, especially with MS, are men, because many, uh, we know that the majority of people with MS are women. The ratio is about three to one, uh, women to men. And so there are a lot of concerns or things that are particular to men that may be underserved. And then um, finally, and this of course is not an exhaustive list, but just kind of my top of the line list, are certainly people over the age of 55. There are a lot of questions about what we do with MS treatments for those people. There are also a lot of questions about if people should be treated after a certain age. And then how do we kind of reconcile the aging process with the progression of MS and how do we sort out what is normal aging versus what may be related to MS? And so these are all groups that we could consider underserved. When we talk about access to neurologists, um, you know, this is an older study, but I think it still really applies today that looked at the characteristics of people who were less likely to see neurologists for their multiple sclerosis. So this does not necessarily mean a specialist. We we're just talking about neurologists who do see uh, people with MS. So certainly people who don't have uh, health insurance. Um, those of lower income, um, and I did not include lower socioeconomic status on my last slide, but that also will be an underserved group. Um, African-American uh, were less likely to see a neurologist, people though, living in rural areas, and though who had, those who had had illness longer than 15 years. Um, so not only is there an issue with people getting access to subspecialty care, meaning MS specialists, but in many cases, there are groups of people who don't even have access to general neurology. So why is it important for people to um, have access to at least a neurologist, right? Um, because they're more likely to undergo diagnostic tests, um, such as MRIs, to kind of keep up with the 
um, progression of their MS or to make sure their MS is stable. Um, they're more likely to undergo treatment related tests, such as if people have bladder issues, they may be referred to certain specialists for evaluation and also receive treatment for those types of symptoms. And then they're also more likely to be um, at least have an understanding of and be treated with disease modifying therapies, as well as talk about alternative therapies um, and have a treatment plan if their current treatment plan is not working. And so it's really important that people have access to a neurologist to address the issues with their MS. And of course, if you have access to a specialty care center, in many cases, that's even better because there are many doctors around the country who specialize in MS and they treat mostly people with MS and can kind of deal with many of the issues related to the disease overall. So um, access to um, healthcare services, how far do you live from a healthcare facility? Transportation, right? Do you have reliable transportation? I certainly have been in situations where, you know, my car may be good enough to go to the store and get me to work, but if I'm talking about driving two and three hours to see a specialist, my car might not be quite that good. And then depending on the level of disability you have, you may need a family member or someone else to drive you to certain appointments that are far away. Social support is extremely important. Um, do you have someone that can go to visits with you? Um, if you have uh, small children to watch, can, is there someone available to watch the children while you go to those visits? And then of course, language and literacy becomes an issue if you're not primarily an English speaker. Um, so there are a lot of things that really affect how much we're able to access the healthcare system, how well we are able to engage in our healthcare, and how consistent we can be in keeping up with our health. And this is extremely important for people who have chronic diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So when we think about models of care, there are a couple of different models, and certainly this is also not an exhaustive list, but these are the three most common ones that I see as an MS specialist and also as a person who does general neurology. So there are some people who have um, access to a general neurologist, and they primarily follow with them for their MS care. And there are many excellent general neurologists who are doing a great job treating MS um, in the community. Um, then there are some people who exclusively go to a specialty care center. For instance, I live in Atlanta. There are a large number of people with MS that live in Atlanta and the surrounding suburbs because nobody actually lives in Atlanta. Everybody lives in the burbs. Um, but um, there are lots of people who come to specialty centers in the city. Um, and then there are even some people who live several hours away who still primarily come to the specialty center for treatment and receive all their treatment there. And then what I often see, especially nowadays, um, with the advent of telemedicine and things like that, is that I often see a kind of hybrid of care where someone will follow with a specialty center, um, but will also have a general neurologist close to home. And I usually recommend that model for my patients who live over an hour or more away, because if you live further away from the doctor and something happens to you, you probably won't be able to kind of hop in the car and drive two hours to be seen. And so it's good to have a local neurologist if you need it to be admitted to the hospital or if you needed to see somebody very urgently. So, um, so what are kind of the pros of virtual visits, right? So so when we talk about models of care, we have to think about how things have adjusted during this age of COVID-19. And one of the biggest things that's happened is that we have a lot of virtual visits. So whereas most of our visits used to be in person, and I have been uh, fortunate to be doing telemedicine probably for over 10 years, but it was mostly for things like stroke. So we didn't really have a lot of virtual or telemedicine visits that were directed specifically for MS. It was mostly for stroke. So what are kind of the pros of this type of virtual environment. Number one, you don't have to go in to be seen. Um, and so for many who may have difficulty with mobility or for those who may not be able to miss a full day of work to go into the doctor, um, I've had several patients who would go sit in their car, <laughs> you know, or be at home on their break and be able to engage in the healthcare system and talk to their doctors, um, you know, remotely. The other thing that's really cool about virtual visits is that family members who are in different places can often participate in the consultation. So for instance, I've had sometimes one patient who's at work and their husband may be, you know, working somewhere else. And if we're doing, you know, uh, you know, a compliant 
platform like Zoom or something like that, both of them can log in and we can talk at the same time, even though they're not at the same place. Um, also, sometimes the conversations are a little bit more focused and goal oriented, right? You're at home. You don't want to sit and talk to me for five hours. Um, and so, you know, th th we often have very focused conversations um, and we kind of cut to the chase um, very quickly and efficiently so that not so that we don't waste any of your precious time at home as well as, you know, we're able to move and see our other patients as well. And then also the cool thing is that there's so many different types of telemedicine platforms that most people are able to navigate the technology. Now, this can also be a challenge because there are some of my patients who have difficulty navigating the technology. And although we can do phone visits, it's not quite um, as efficient as being able to see somebody and interact with them in real time. I would also say sometimes patients may communicate a little more openly when they're in a very familiar environment sitting at home. They may be more willing to tell me some of the issues that are going on with them as well. And so what are some of the challenges, right? Um, you know, depending on the clinic, they have different access to virtual communication. There are some systems that are very easy to use. There are some that are a little bit more cumbersome. Um, for some of my older patients, um, it can be difficult to use the technology. So I've had some where I used to have a system where I would send a text message and you just kind of log right in. Um, but oftentimes I would have to do that phone call because people really couldn't get a handle of how to log into that system. Also, you have to have a good internet connection, right? Um, and so depending on where you live, if you don't have a good connection, that may inhibit your ability um, to engage in telemedicine. Also for people with either cognitive challenges, whether it's related to their MS or other things, or if you have difficulty with your vision or your hearing, this could make it a little bit more difficult to engage in a virtual visit. Um, and then of course, um, some people uh, may not be in an appropriate place to share information. So, you know, I generally recommend that people be in a quiet place, but I've had a couple patients who are literally like on their break or kind of walking through Walmart talking to me. Um, and so it makes it a little bit more difficult to engage in a personal conversation in that way. And then of course, a telemedicine or remote exam does not replace a physical exam. And so although we can see a lot as clinicians and as healthcare providers, it certainly is not as good as being able to see you in person. So we'll switch gears here and talk a little bit about kind of clinical trials, right? So as we have all of these advances in the technology, the way that um, we deliver care, well, one of the things that I've really challenged my colleagues with is to see how we can implement some of this digital technology um, into our clinical trial experience. For those of you who've ever heard me talk about MS and about the need for diversity in clinical trials, one of the biggest issues is that many of our trials are not conducted in the US, many of our trials for our regular medications are conducted in Eastern Europe, and we don't have a lot of diversity in the age of patients. We don't have a lot of diversity um, in the ethnicity, uh, the ethnic backgrounds of our patients. Um, and so it makes it difficult to generalize some of our findings because we only have one group of people in our research studies. And if you look at kind of some of the statistics, this is a problem, not just for MS, but for all areas of medicine. So even diseases like hypertension and diabetes, that may disproportionately affect people of color, we still have issues getting people enrolled in clinical trials. So why is this even important? Why does Dr. Williams talk about this every time she gives a talk? Um, because it is important, um, because we know that um, groups, certain groups, including um, minority patients, also including uh, people over the age of 55 are underrepresented in our clinical trials for MS. And some of these differences will help us understand um, how MS works in all people and also help us to generalize, as I said, the findings from our studies. Do we see the same side effects? Do we see the same um, biologic changes in all of the medications? And although most of our DNA is the same, right? So we're not saying that people are so drastically different um, that, um, you know, there that we would expect um, some huge difference in the results. But even though we're still mostly the same, sometimes those very little subtle differences can, can possibly be the key to unlocking certain treatments or unlocking certain biomarkers or things that we can use to assess the progression of MS. And so it's important to have that diversity because it makes our research rich, okay? And it also um, helps us to understand all populations and make sure that what we're doing is really, truly helping everyone with MS.
So what are some of the barriers to research recruitment, right? Um, so certainly there are some patient barriers and institutional barriers, but before I talk about that, I think one of the first things we talk about is what are some of the pros or what are some of the good things about clinical research? And so some of the good things about clinical research um, are number one, it is access to cutting edge medicine, right? Um, you know, and access to very high quality care. So there are certain standards that, um, uh, institutions have to meet to be involved in clinical research. There are certain protocols for how often people need to be seen. In some cases, depending on the study, there may be free access to things like their doctor visits. There may be free access to MRIs. There may be free access to treatment. Um, and so, you know, overall, you get seen and you get evaluated very thoroughly for your condition. Um, and that definitely is a plus. And you contribute to the um, betterment of the whole MS community by helping us understand um, MS and how the disease works and how different treatments work. Um, but certainly there are some barriers to uh, having diversity in clinical research. Um, one of them is that it's sometimes difficult to find out where studies are being conducted um, in your area. Um, and so it's also important to make sure um, that you understand the safety, right? Because there's certainly are risks for clinical trials. Um, and then there's also competing cost and time. You know, if you have to take off work for a certain number of visits, um, that may be a difficult for you, it may be a difficult thing for you to participate. And then when we talk about institutional barriers, we think about things like um, the inclusion criteria. So when you do a research study, whether it is a clinical trial or whether it is in some cases like a registry where you may fill out a questionnaire or something about exercise, there are often criteria for people who can be included in the study and those who may not be good candidates for the study. And especially for our clinical trial, sometimes those criteria are very restrictive. So they exclude certain groups of people. So automatically age gets excluded because most of our trials go up to the age Age of 55, and then also certain groups who have, for instance, a lot of comorbidities, so other diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure. If the criteria is very, very strict, it may automatically exclude certain groups of people. So that's certainly something um, that needs to be worked on. And then also looking at the site selection, meaning the places where the studies are conducted um, may not be places that have a lot of cultural diversity or a lot of uh, different populations of people with MS. And then when we talk about solutions, there certainly are some things that we can look at as potential solutions. Um, I'm not going to read uh, read these verbatim, um, but these are just some ideas. You know, and there are many people who've been working on these efforts to try to increase diversity in our clinical research, certainly broadening the criteria, as I just discussed, um, developing recruitment strategies that focus on diversity um, and decreasing some of the burdensome components. Are there things that can be done remotely? Are there things that don't require people? to come in for so many visits or things that can be done in their community. And also we have to create processes for longevity to try to keep that work going so that people can stay um, in studies if they choose to participate in them. All right. And so finally, last year, we're going to switch talking a little bit about communication with your healthcare team. Um, so, you know, I am always a, a big advocate of self-advocacy. Um, you know, I, I encourage my patients to learn about their diagnosis, learn about treatment options, know why we're doing what we're doing and to continue to ask questions. And so this is a huge part um, and it really has changed the way that we deliver healthcare. So there's a really big focus in the medical community on what we call shared decision making. That means no longer does the doctor just kind of tell you this is what we're gonna do and you're gonna go home and do it. We have a conversation about what would be best for your lifestyle. What do we think the pros and cons of this are? And we try to come up with a plan together, right? And so things that you can do um, are certainly to stick with the plan that you and your healthcare team come up with. And if you're having trouble, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help, okay? Um, this is extremely important uh, for you and for your um, family members. And so one of the ways that we can think about communication is how, what are kind of tips that we can use to help best communicate uh, with your healthcare team? So prepare for your doctor's visit, right? Whether it's a telemedicine visit or an in-person visit. I tell people to prepare, have a list of questions, things that you want to accomplish. It's okay to have goals for your doctor's visit, right? Because you want to get something out of it. And oftentimes when I see my patients, I ask them, what would you like to get out of today's visit? Um, 
Another tip or another important piece is being honest about the difficulties that you're facing, right? It doesn't help us when you just put on a brave face and act like nothing's wrong. We cannot fix or address issues that we don't know exist. I have this uh, line at the bottom of my email that says the man who conceals his disease can never be cured. Um, and so even though there are many things we can't cure, there are things that we can address, but we don't know to address them if you don't say anything. So for that reason, I do encourage people to bring their family uh, members or their care partners to visits with them, whether they are remote visits or they are in-person visits. I call them my truth tellers. Um, not that my patients aren't telling the truth, but sometimes their care partners tell a little bit more of the truth um, of what's really going on at home. And so uh, allowing your healthcare team to get that big picture really helps us to address what is the best plan? Is what we're doing really working or do we need to switch gears and do something else? Um, don't be afraid to ask questions, right? My goal is to have uh, people understand to the best of their ability what's going on. Um, and so don't be afraid to ask if you don't understand. And then the last tip that I would leave is to follow up if the plan is not working, right? So one of the things that I often caution my patients against is if we try something and it's not working and your appointment's in six months, don't wait six months to come back and tell me, oh, it didn't work, I stopped after a week, okay? Because oftentimes there are things that we can do to adjust the plan in between rather than losing five or six months of time um, without having an adjustment in the plan. And so the last couple of things I want to leave you with is that there is hope. This is an extremely exciting time in the field of MS. And I know that it's not exciting for anyone to get diagnosed with MS. Um, and certainly living with MS is not easy, but there has been so, there have been so many advancements and there's so much work that's being done not just to help improve the treatment of MS, there's work that's being done to try to reverse the damage that's been done for MS. I think, and also importantly, there's a lot of work that's being done to address these underserved populations and try to come up with creative solutions to make sure that everyone has equal access to MS care. And I'll just highlight a few of those. Um, a couple that I'm involved in. So of course you have great education. I have to pause and say you have great educational content from groups like Stewart and MS Views and News. And so you have a wealth of information with MS experts from all around the country that are talking about um, different topics related to MS. So making sure you're able to educate yourself is extremely important. And Stewart does an amazing job um, of kind of varying the topics and having people talk about different things. And then and also, there are a couple of other groups that are doing some great work as well. Um, I'm a part of the MS in the 21st Century Initiative, which is primarily um, a European initiative uh, that is now expanded to the U.S. We just were able to go live in the U.S. over the summer. Um, but there are certain uh, tools uh, on the website, including a toolkit that you can use to prepare for your doctor's visit. And there are also some tools that uh, we created uh, to help you better understand navigating MS and facilitate communication with your healthcare provider and your healthcare team. Um, so that's certainly something to look out for. There, of course, is I Conquer MS, which is a patient-driven research organization um, that looks to try to understand what topics of research are important for people living with MS. Certainly, we as researchers have our ideas of what we think is important, but it may not be as important to you as it is to us. And so it's a great organization that tries to look at the issues that are very specific um, and very relevant to those who are living with MS and try to collaborate and partner with different groups to come up with um, projects that help address those issues like diet and exercise um, and things that help your quality of life overall. And then, of course, there's the National African Americans with MS Registry, uh, which just rolled out in September, which I'm super excited about. It's a project um, that has been in the making for probably at least 10 years, but diligently for the past three years. Um, and we're trying to better understand MS in the African American community. And so I'm very excited about that. Okay, last couple slides. If you want to stay connected with me, I am the nerdy neurologist. I have on my nerdy neurologist gear today. Um, even though, I, sorry, I didn't put on any makeup for you guys. But I do have my nerdy neurologist gear on. Um, and this is how you can find me on social media, on various channels, um, Facebook, Insta, uh, you know, Twitter, and YouTube. And there's a website at the bottom. And then finally, I end every uh, talk with this slide. All I need is peace, love, and a freaking cure for multiple sclerosis.
Excellent. Thank you. And as you saw, I'm clapping for you. And I'm hoping everybody else is clapping also, okay? <laughs> quite, a few, quite a few people on uh, online, so I'm very happy for that. And I want to thank everybody for being with this MSV is the News program. And uh, we have questions, all right? We have questions from people that are writing in online. And again, for all those that are online right now, please, if you have any questions about anything that Dr. Williams spoke about this evening, please ask, you know, type it in and um and um and we'll and we'll get to your question also if you find that you have a question from a question being asked ask your question all right it can't get answered unless you ask so please ask away all right first one is from somebody named antoinette and by the way i am mentioning first names and you are not the only person by your first name everywhere in the united states okay so just be cool i'm not answering i'm not saying any last names all right all right, right. So no, no home addresses, no home addresses, no social security numbers. No phone numbers, no email addresses, no TikTok, no nothing like that, all right? Okay, gotcha. All right, so Antoinette asks, how does the scientific community go about finding participants for the trials? The general population usually hears of the results of the study before we are made aware of it, even if yes. and where it's taking place. Also, are there any ethical standards for it? Yes, so great question. So so I'll answer the second one first. So absolutely there are ethical standards. Um, I've actually done a series of programs before where we talk about um, the way that research is set up. For some communities, there is a lot of stigma surrounding research because of history of past discrimination um, and unethical research that's been done. Um, you know, it, it's very strict now um, the criteria to be able to do any type of study on human beings, even for us to be able to do a questionnaire, there's very detailed ethical committees that determine if we can do that type of work, even something as simple as a questionnaire. So if you think about an actual study where people are receiving a procedure or even a medication, the criteria is even more strict. Now, in terms of how sites are chosen to do research studies, there are a couple of different ways. So depends on the type of study. Um, there are some studies that are done by companies and so they have a process that they go through to pick certain sites um, whether they are uh, clinics or whether they are academic centers across the country to be able to do that research um, and then if it is for instance a study that I want to do then I may be able to reach out to some of my colleagues and choose certain sites to have that done um, and so you know one one of the difficulties is that people don't know where to find out about research so I usually suggest you know if there's an academic center or a large MS center close to you, usually there is some clinical research being conducted. And so I often would have people call our practice and ask about studies that are being conducted. But those are excellent questions. You identified several varied underserved communities. How do we get services to these people? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, so also an excellent question. I think that it's going to be a multi um, faceted effort. So I think um, certainly the advent of telemedicine, which literally went from being a theory um, for MS to being a reality because of a crisis period, um, will be certainly one way to reach a lot of people that previously couldn't be reached. As I said, you know, you have to think about things that people are salary workers and their MS center is far away. You know, it's difficult to take a, a day off of work or get family members to do that. So so uh, we're able to reach a lot more people with um, telemedicine services. Um, but I think that it will be a lot of work on the part of, you know, healthcare providers reaching out in the community, our general neurologists also reach out to our MS specialty centers to refer people, as well as our advocacy organizations and educational organizations, making sure that people know where they can find MS care. Um, and so I think it's going to be a combination of all of those things um, to really help reach these populations. Okay, so segmenting off of that a little bit, how to, um, how to get people in remote areas into clinical research studies? And mm -hmm. will they be reimbursed for their hotels or travel? Yes. Um, so great question. I know all the questions are great, but all the questions really are great. I'm not being facetious. Uh, so when you think about it depends on the type of clinical trial. So if we're talking about clinical trials, 
Um, one of the efforts uh, for myself and many of my colleagues who are looking at increasing diversity is to try to increase um, the reimbursement for things like travel, things like parking. One of the difficulties is that you have to kind of walk a fine line because you want because, you know, there are regulations on what can be reimbursed, but it also can't appear that you are actually being paid to do that type of research. You know, there is research you can get paid to do. I used to do, it's called market studies, where I go like try on different jeans and wear Coke, you know, try try different types of Coca-Cola and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to clinical research, there are lots of regulations so that it doesn't look like they're enticing you or coercing you to be in the study by paying you um, you know, like a salary. Um, so we're working on ways to try to balance that. Um, but in many cases, there is reimbursement for transportation. Um, and for some studies, um, there are reimbursement for lodging if it requires you to be somewhere for multiple days. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And that was by a guy named Stuart. I forgot to mention his name. All yeah, right. Next, Stuart. I know him. That, I'm sure you do. Um, so now another similar question is from a gentleman named Mark. How can we address the challenges of getting to care to rural America for MS and other types of illnesses? And how can teaching institutions extend their scope to rural America? Yeah, so I think really telemedicine is going to be the way that we're able to accomplish that. And, you know, it was a really effective model for stroke care. So, you know, although I am an MS specialist, I'm also a neurologist. And so I've treated quite a few strokes in my day. And I remember the times where, you know, a hospital that was maybe an hour away from a major city would call us. We would have to make a decision about how to treat someone over the phone. Um, those decisions obviously aren't the greatest when we're just talking to someone and we can't see the patient. And we've really seen that evolve now to where there are very um, well set up systems where there's a computer, people know how to do the exams and we can log on, we can see the patients and we can get a lot more people treated effectively in those emergency situations um, because we're able to see them and interact and there are protocols in place. I do think that there will um, need to likely be partnerships with neurologists in rural communities, um, not necessarily hospitals where they can go in and have access to an MS specialist um, where we can do a consult and help to treat people who have MS um, and kind of, again, create that collaborative model where there is an MS specialist, but also a general neurologist, and we're working together to make sure that people are getting adequate care. Okay, great. Thank you. Joyce mm -hmm. asks, please tell us more about um, the African American with MS registry and how to get involved. Yes. Um, so that slide, unfortunately, was one of my old slides that didn't have the um, website on it. Um, but the website is uh, www.naamsr, so NAMSAR, NAMSAR.org. Um, and so that's how you can sign up and log on for the registry. Um, the questionnaire is quite involved. Um, so I always warn people that you may have to save it and come back to it, but don't give up on it. Um, so it, currently, um, anybody who has MS can go on and sign up for it. You don't need your doctor to sign up for it, but it is for people who are of African descent so we can better understand MS. Can you do me a big favor right now? Can you scribble it out on a piece of paper and just hold it up? Uh, sure. Or I can, can I type it in the chat? You can, yes. You mm -hmm. can do that. But then I have to ask you a question while you're doing that. Can you do those two things at oh, the same time? I Great. can. I can. I'm Great. a mom. Great. 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 I'm a mom of children who <laughs> run in. So I've got to do multiple things at the same time. Okay. Great. So Jill again is asking, will telemed continue to be approved post-COVID crisis? We'll see, you know, so there are a lot of us who like telemedicine um, and who want it to stick around. Um, one of the biggest barriers has been insurance companies. And so, of course, when the uh, pandemic first started, there was a lot of um, cooperation, we'll use that word, um, where companies were willing to pay um, for these remote visits because obviously we were in a crisis. Um, and even though the pandemic is still um, very serious, um, even as things began to ease off, we started to see some pushback where insurance companies were saying, no, we're not gonna pay 
for these visits. Um, so it will kind of depend on many of our advocacy groups, as well as our advocacy groups within the neurologic community, our societies really pushing to try to um, maintain the ability for us to do these visits and to be reimbursed for our work. Okay, thank you. Now, getting away from these questions for a moment, and then we are definitely gonna get back to it because there are just so many asking similar questions, but that are different. But we have one person that's been asking me to ask this question for quite some time, and I wanna make sure to take care of it. And yeah. the question is, what is the role of caretakers their importance and the benefit of having one. Yeah, so so care, so, so the word has evolved over time. Um, so, you know, caregivers, caretakers, there are certainly people who have caretakers, especially um, many of those who have severe disability. Um, but for those who don't have as severe disability, many of them have more of what we would call care partners, right? So just because you're walking around and doing everything you need to do with MS doesn't mean you don't need help. Um, and so when we think about the importance of care partners, um, it's important because MS is a chronic disease. People have ups and downs. You need somebody to kind of help you walk through um, some of those down phases. I think that also care partners are very essential to the healthcare team because oftentimes they can advocate for you, especially if you aren't feeling well, to make sure the doctor knows what's going on to help um, you get appropriate treatment. And also, as I said, I often advocate for care partners to be active parts of our visits because sometimes they see things that you don't see, right? You know, so oftentimes we think we're doing fine and we don't realize that we asked that question 10 times already. But the person that's around you all the time, the person that sees how you're doing can tell when you have those subtle changes and really provide um, you know more of a complete history of what's going on I'll give a very uh, quick example I had one patient um, wonderful young woman with MS and so she would come in and tell me you know I'm having a little bit of trouble with my thinking but overall I'm doing good I'm doing good you know and then she might say I'm having a little trouble at work but I'm doing good and then her husband comes to a visit and he's like she's had four car accidents in the past two months right um, and so she really didn't realize how severe the cognitive issues were. And so if I hadn't had that other piece of the story, you know, we would have continued in the same vein and not been able to switch gears. And so, you know, I often tell people they really want to help and, you know, let them help kind of provide that other perspective so we get a clear picture. Okay. So they are essential. They are essential. All right. So, all right. So next, um, we have Sage. Can I get an appointment for a virtual appointment to even get a plan for my spouse? He literally is living with PPMS and has no treatment plan because we are so rural. Six to seven hours to the closest mm -hmm. MS center. Yeah, so, you know, different MS centers have different policies. You know, um, one of the difficulties is that it, you, it, would, it would really depend on the policy of that MS center. Oftentimes for that first visit, it's very important that you get seen in person. Now, during the pandemic, there were many of us who were doing new patient visits um, remotely. Um, but honestly, that first visit, you almost, you really, really need to be seen in person. And then after that, after somebody's seen you at least once, um, then it is often more appropriate to do follow-up visits. Um, but I certainly would just check in with the policy of that center and see um, if a new patient visit can be done remotely because everybody's rules kind of vary a little bit. I just give them a call and see. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Now, for those that do not have any kind of medical insurance at all. Mm -hmm. What is the best way for them to try to get the medication? Should they try to contact the manufacturer? We know that many times that the, um, that the actual insurance company cannot work with the patient unless they have some form of insurance. So how do, what, what is another avenue that they can try? Right. So now it depends on if you're on a medication and then you lose insurance, 
there are programs with most of the companies that will assist people who don't have insurance in receiving their MS specific medication, right? So we're talking about your disease modifying drugs, not necessarily your symptom management like your gabapentin and all that. Those, that's a totally separate thing. Talking specifically about your MS disease modifying therapies. So there, are, most of the companies do have assistance programs where if you lose insurance, you're on therapy, most of the time you can get your therapy for free if you contact the company and talk to them about their patient assistance. Um, now, if you're not on medication and you want to start medication, um, they, there's, those assistance companies are available, but you will have to initially have the medication prescribed by a physician. So you'll have to see somebody and they'll have to prescribe the medication and then you may be able um, most people who don't have insurance qualify for free medication for at least one, one of the companies. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so Robert asks a different question. What would yeah. you recommend to a patient who is struggling with progressive MS but does not like or does not believe their PCP can help guide them to a specialist? And what can the patient do to advocate for them for their own treatment if the knowledge base is lacking because of medical shortage in, in rural areas? Yeah, so the first thing you try to do again is try to uh, connect with a general neurologist. As I said, there are many general neurologists that are doing a great job taking care of MS because there are just not that many MS specialists across the country. Um, so the first thing you want to do is connect with a general neurologist. You know, if you have MS, most, even PCPs consider it reasonable for you to at least see a neurologist, okay? Um, so that usually is not an issue to get a referral to see one. And then from the neurologist, you may be able to um, access specialty care. I know that there are some programs through the MS Society where certain specialty centers like Johns Hopkins are collaborating with um, community neurologists to consult on people who have MS to help care for people who have MS. Um, but certainly um, a general neurologist would be the place to start. Um, and just, you know, I've had many pe people that have just called their doctor or asked for a referral, depending on the type of insurance you have, you may just be able to go directly and make an appointment uh, with a general neurologist, but kind of see what those options are, um, you know, and ask them for a referral to a neurologist. Okay, thank you. So mm -hmm. on the opposite side of everything, a person is asking what they can do to help others in their, in their community with multiple sclerosis. I'm not sure, really sure where this person, he or she is coming from as far as providing your information or what, but if you have any idea what you can suggest, that would be great. Yeah, so there are a lot of avenues for people to be advocates um, in different ways. I mean, Stuart has done some amazing work. I remember your newsletter that used to go out, and now you have this amazing organization that provides um, great educational content. Um, but everyone can help in, in whatever their area is. I'm a huge advocate of people starting support groups, right? So if there's not a support group in your area, that might be a great way to start to connect with people in the MS community, whether it's through um, talking about topics, sharing information, um, or, you know, making sure people have access to different uh, avenues of education such as such as this. Um, but we all can be an advocate wherever we are. So, you know, look for those opportunities. I've had some people that have volunteered in certain places at certain clinics doing things. Um, I've had people that volunteered with our societies or our foundations or the MSAA, um, people that have created walk teams, people that have created support groups. Um, or educational content. So, you know, just kind of see what what you're good at and then uh, get in where you fit in, so to speak, would be my would be my advice. So for any thank you for that. For anybody in rural areas, MS Views and Nudes leads all other patient advocacy organizations in the United States in providing educational programs in rural America. So if you would like to contact me or somebody from my staff. We will speak with you about things that we would like you to do by contacting local support group leaders or others in the area where you can help direct them to the programs that we're providing. We're now doing eight programs a month virtually, all right? And we are going to start doing some real hybrid programs again. Yay! We're going to start doing yeah. some live programs again, okay? And so many people are wanting them, and so many people know that we are 
we are we provided a great model for for creating a live in-person program and doing it virtually as well it's very socially distanced it works it has worked we've done it five times wow five times in the last uh year it's amazing to say that but when we used to do 70 programs a year but um but we can if you can contact me we can help create things for you to do for those in rural america okay awesome. all right now back to antoinette how can we make support group more sexy many people feel we are just a bunch of folks complaining and laminating lamenting sorry not laminating that's what you should do with your vaccine. <laughs> let's right. hope we're not laminating, laminating. that right. really is boring. we're, we're talking about well. lamenting with one another they just don't know we are in middle of georgia warner brothers georgia i am a fearless co-leader of the i guess warner Ro warner robbins support group in that area and i also have ppms and 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 other issues so so how do we say. bring sexy back to support groups um you know so i have had um i've given a lot of talks to different support groups and some of them are just uh, focused around different things, right? You know, so some of them are set up. Um, I kind of look at them as what was that? What was that website they used to have called Meetup, right? Meetup.com, where you basically would have an interest and you could look it up, and whoever likes anime could meet up, whoever likes dinner could meet up. So I do have some of my patients or people that I know who create, um, you know, support groups that are around certain topics. They might just want to go eat brunch you know, or they might want to go to the movie. So maybe varying the activities um, could be one way to garner interest of, you know, different types of people, um, you know, so, you know, making it activity based in some cases and, um, you know, not necessarily just sitting in a room or, or doing different activities. So, you know, I think there, there are different ways you can kind of spice it up. Um, but you have to be kind of intentional with it and kind of think outside the box, um, because if you just go and sit in a room every time, um, it kind of lends itself to sometimes, you know, kind of where people talk about their issues and their things that they need to get out. Um, but if that's not what you want to do, then you can kind of vary those activities uh, once outside is open again. OK, I have to apologize to Antoinette. Somebody else's thing they wrote in PPMS. It wasn't Antoinette, but. Uh, I'm not okay. going to say the other. I'm not going to say the other name either. But somebody had written okay. it. I don't remember who it is at this point in time. All right. So next, we're going to go back to Robert. No, stop. I'm not going to do Robert yet because he's asked a few. Let's hit on James. He's new. Where I live, I have a great neurologist, but there are not any MS specialists. Is there any advantage to both? I have PPMS. Oh, there's the person. I have PPMS with mobility issues. Sorry, I'm not laughing about the PPMS. Right. So, um, so certainly there can be advantages to having an MS specialist. Um, oftentimes they have access to different resources, depending on the type of center. I've worked at multiple um, types of MS centers. Some of them we've had, you know, rehabilitation in-house. We've had psychology in-house. We've had all our subspecialists in-house, kind of a one-stop shop where you can get the MRI and then see the person afterwards. So sometimes there are advantages where you can get all of your care kind of done in one stop. You know, um, and then also sometimes, you know, there's a level of expertise about different treatment options for symptoms as well as for the disease. Um, you know, so I've had I encourage most people to at least see an MS specialist once. And I've had people that have come to see me for a second opinion and love their general neurologist and stay with their general neurologist and I, you know. I think that's great. Um, but, you know, it, it certainly wouldn't help to get a second set of eyes to look at things um, and, you know, see if there are any alternate plans um, or alternate things they recommend for care. Let's go back to Robert, though, and we're talking about just non-COVID still. Uh, what yeah. options would you suggest for those with MS who lost their main caregivers, care partner or health insurance due to COVID-19? That's the heavy one. Um, so again, just kind of depending on um, where you receive care, you always reach out to your healthcare provider. Um, there are often programs 
where, uh, especially at some MS centers, where they do like a sliding scale maybe for visits so that people can still come and be seen. You know, I think the first thing is to reach out for help, right? Um, there are organizations that can help. Um, your healthcare provider may have access to resources. Um, again, MS medications usually can be um, paid, you know, can be covered for those who don't have insurance, but first kind of connect with your healthcare provider to see what resources they can give you access to um, or what direction they can point you in, depending on what you need, whether it's MS, you know, services, medications, et cetera. So something else that he had said, which I did not include in the first portion was, what are the options for those in rural America with limited resources or ability for that self-care? So do you know of anything that's available for those in rural areas where, again, um, you know, what might be available for them with regard to finding caregivers, or should they, again, contact the, the sources that you just gave? So I would contact the source. Another one you could consider is um, the MS Society does have an MS Navigator program, which is almost kind of like a caseworker, um, social services um, group of people who may be able to direct you to other resources in your area. So that I, I would also reach out to them. And then, of course, our other um, like the MS Foundation often has like um, not caregivers, but they may have things like equipment, lending library for equipment for those who you know may have uh, financial difficulties. And uh, they also have other programs where in some cases they may pay for transportation uh, for you to get to doctor's visits. So definitely check out your uh, societies and foundations, but first reach out to your healthcare provider to see what they recommend first. Okay, thank you. So back mm -hmm. to the person from middle Georgia. Uh, yep. Partnerships with providers in rural communities is imperative when receiving uncommon infusion treatments. We, we need more options in middle Georgia. Most of us have to go to Atlanta for like Ocrevus infusions. So what options do they have? Yeah, so it, it really just kind of depends, you know, um, and so that's that's one of the difficulties, you know, uh, there's a good side and a bad side. So I have, um, you know, when I was at my previous practice, we had the ability for people to come and get infusions in the clinic. And actually, I personally preferred that. Um, because as a physician who's very familiar with the medication, if you're in a specialty center with people who are familiar with administering that medication, they know how to navigate if you have issues. Uh, one of the things that could often be very frustrating is that if I did have patients who had infusions that were off site in a rural area, um, some of those sites didn't have a physician on staff. And so they would call me you know, out of clinic, seeing the people I'm seeing in clinic about a person that I can't see and I can't see what's going on with the side effects that they're having. And so, you know, the model of care can be very difficult when people are getting infusions remotely. Um, but certainly, you know, one of the things is to, you know, reach out. Um, often the companies can be very helpful with telling you what infusion centers are closer to you um, that may um, be amenable to giving medication. So that's one thing you can do to reach out um, to the actual company to see if there are any infusion centers closer by. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So I do have questions to that are related to COVID. I do have a couple of others that are um, that have to do with just regular symptoms. What are the best exercises for MS patients with no showing disabilities at this time? Whatever exercises you want to do. Um, <laughs> so I encourage people to exercise as tolerated, right? Um, in general, for people who have uh, difficulty with mobility, um, oftentimes swimming is a great exercise because it eliminates the gravity and people don't get fatigued as much. But if you don't have any signs of disability, work out to your heart's content, you know, so um, Peloton, right. swimming, running, whatever it is you want to do. I've had plenty of patients who are marathon runners and, you know, just do what you can tolerate. Sure, sure. Is there a specific water temperature that people should swim in? Yeah, so not super hot water, right? Because we know that heat and hot water can um, temporarily worsen MS symptoms. So I don't recommend people get in like heated pools, um, you know, like warm sauna sure. type super hot. But other than that, you know, not not necessarily. I don't have a specific temperature in mind that I know of that uh, okay. would be more. Thank you. 
Um, is there mm -hmm. anything for a person that gets leg stiffness at night, what they could do? Yes, talk to your healthcare provider because I cannot give specific medical advice, um, but there are treatments that can help that symptom, which is called spasticity um, and also uh, stretching uh, and working with physical therapy can help that as well. So since this question was brought up, I'm going to bring up something about myself with that problem. All right. I get toes curling in the middle of the night or going up one way or the other, and I can't do anything with them. And if I try to do anything with it, it seems to like then go radiate all the way up my leg and goes into my mm -hmm. calf and gets into my upper thigh. And I cannot wait to get out of bed. And then I have to step on my feet one by one to get them to flatten out. What is mm -hmm. that caused by? Or are you going to tell me to speak to my medical provider? I'm going to tell you to speak to your medical provider, uh, but it also sounds like spasticity. So spasticity is a problem that happens from damage to the brain or the spinal cord from the central nervous system. And essentially the muscles tighten or contract when they're not supposed to. Um, that comes in a variety of flavors, as I say. So for some people, it is like a cramp, like a Charlie horse. For some people, it's a squeezing sensation like a rubber band. For some people, it's the feeling that their muscles are exhausted like they were out but they really didn't work out um, and then for some people it can actually be a jerking motion like a kicking motion but all of those things fit into spasticity and it's basically the muscles the nerves are causing the muscles to contract inappropriately um, you know and it can happen in a foot in a leg often is in the fingers and the arms as well so taking that a step further I find that it's worse when my legs are underneath the covers and mm -hmm. It's a battle to get out from under the covers. I mean, I, I could be screaming the pain is so bad and uh, literally screaming and uh, waking up the whole hotel that I'm in. <laughs> so, um, so, and then I get out of the covers and when I get it all straightened out by stepping on my foot and getting it, you know, where I can walk around again without any pain, if I sleep then the rest of the night without any covers on my feet, I have zero additional problems. Has that got anything so everybody's, to do? So everybody's triggers are a little different. So spasticity um, can be a very sensitive symptom. So um, if you sit too long, it can have it can get worse. If you stand too long, it can get worse. Um, if you move too much, if you don't move, if your jeans are too tight, um, I mean, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, literally anything. <laughs> I mean, literally, everybody's trigger is different, you know. So again, sure. you know, talking to your doctor, oftentimes weather can make it worse. Fatigue can make it worse. Excessive activity, doing 160 programs all across, you know. So you have to kind of figure out, you know, what are those triggers with your body and then talk to your doctor um, about whether there are, you know, different interventions that can be done to help that. I have some people with spasticity medicine who need it every day. I have some people who know, all right, when I do this, 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 and this, I need to take something. So it's kind of working with them to figure out, you know, what are those conditions that really set you off and then seeing how you need to treat during those times. Right. So I've had people, well, I have, a, I know a lot of people that have similar condition and they've been told try potassium doesn't work. Try magnesium doesn't work. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, I guess it's up in the air, like you said, for everybody, it's just a little bit different and what might really yeah. work for them or not. Right. Okay. All right, right. Next one. Best way to work with cognitive issues. Meaning. Forget. What's he say? No, I mean, what did I don't I don't understand what that means. The best way to work with to work like what, go to work. Or what what might I don't know. I'm I'm only reading what was written. But so let me ask you, um, do you have anything that's any exercises to help somebody with memory issues? Um. So I don't have specific exercises. Uh, you know, so certainly keeping your mind active helps with memory. So, you know, we think about memory, we think about brain health um, and brain health. The things we do to keep our brains healthy are very similar to what we do to keep our bodies healthy. So exercise, eating a well-balanced diet, keeping your mind engaged, whether that's reading, having conversations, 
Um, you know, some people do different mind games or puzzles that make them think. Um, but keeping your mind engaged is extremely important. And then the other thing for some people is focusing on one thing at a time. You know, often we try to multitask. Um, and some of our issues with memory are because we're trying to do too many things at one time and we can't really take in anything. And so um, making sure that um, we're focusing on what we need to be focused on. Um, and then in some cases, if the memory difficulty is severe, uh, there is cognitive testing that can be done to tell us what parts of the memory in the brain or cognition are, are having difficulty. And in some cases, there's cognitive rehabilitation, which is kind of like, you know, physical therapy. There's cognitive therapy as well. Sure. Thank you. Next question. Mm -hmm. Person writes, can you tell us about vestibular therapy? Yes. So um, if people have difficulty with their balance, their vestibular um, function, meaning off balance uh, with walking, etc., cetera, um, there is such a thing as vestibular rehabilitation. Um, and so it's, again, kind of falls under physical therapy. And usually if you're having that issue, your doctor can refer you to vestibular therapy and they can give you exercises to help you um, with your balance and function so that you're not falling down. OK, great. Thank you. So we have three more questions. They're all on COVID. Okay. <laughs> three, more for, three more for the moment, all right? And okay. um, I, I don't know. I mean, other people might be asking other things after I get started on this, all right? But um, okay. the most simplest one, and we hear about it constantly, and we talk about it constantly, can MS patients with multiple sclerosis, can MS patients with multiple sclerosis, listen to me, can patients with MS take the COVID-19 vaccine? So the short answer is yes. Um, there were some recommendations that were released by the MS Society uh, that suggest that people with MS do get the COVID vaccine. Obviously, you always talk to your healthcare provider first um, to make sure that that's the right decision to you for you. You always talk about the pros and the cons. Um, but currently, it is recommended that unless you have some severe immune deficiency um, or some extenuating circumstance, that most people with MS should um, try to receive the vaccine if it's available to them. Right. And for anybody that wants to see the uh, National Multiple Sclerosis Society guidelines, we do have it listed on our blog. I don't know if it's on the website yet, but it is on the blog. It was in our last newsletter that came out, which was just uh, last week. So you should be able to find it there as well. Um, and if you cannot find it, you can contact me. And if you don't know how to contact me, well, you got noticed to be on this call tonight. So you do know how to contact me. That's, that's a, right. That's, that's showing you that your cognition is really not that bad, all right? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what MS medications are to safely take during the vaccinations? Yeah, so the honest answer is there's a lot of um, expert opinion, but we don't really have a lot of research to back that up yet. Um, and I think the MSS, they may have just released, or maybe those recommendations aren't released, talking about specific medications. Um, but for most of the medications, people should not have issues with getting the vaccine. If you're on medications that deplete the immune cells, like um, anti-CD20 therapies, things like um, rituximab or ocrelizumab or alemtuzumab, um, then talk to your doctor about how they would consider maybe adjusting the timing of the vaccine with when you receive your medication. But it really honestly um, is a kind of case by case basis um, for each, you know, for each of those types of medications, for most of the other medications, it's recommended that there's not a specific time frame or adjustment in dosing that's needed for your medications. You know, from all of this, thank you, Dr. Williams, from all of this, I learned how up to date I am on all the information you just provided. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, 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 I today, Stuart. You've always been up to date, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. But yes, it, it's very important for everybody. Listen, you're all on this call. You're all on this program. It's not a call. It's a, it's a virtual program. Okay. But the same way that you're hearing about things tonight, you can learn about it all just being on the internet. Um, and most simply, you can ask Dr. Google. All right. Everything that you're asking tonight, you could ask that question in a search engine and you could get 
similar answers. It may not be from Dr. Williams, but it's somebody that is nearly as smart as she is, okay? That or or the same keel that or the same level that she's on, and you're going to get excellent answers, all right? So um, don't be afraid of what you find on Google as long as it's up to date, all right? You don't want to take information that was put out many months ago if you're asking about vaccine because it wasn't known several months ago. It's known now. So now is what you could look at and see, okay? Um, there is another question. Of course, Robert came back with another question. I'm going to have to read it all, all right? And then this is the last one, all right? No more questions, Robert. No more questions, Antoinette. This is the last one we're going to do. Getting along the getting going along the lines of how to bring sexy back to support groups. What kinds of community awareness events would be most conclusive or conducive to people living with MS and their families? For example, there are always walk runs or 5Ks. What other types of events would be inclusive to anyone to increase their public health knowledge of MS? I could answer well, that. Think you would be the person to answer that. <laughs> That's Stewart's wheelhouse, not necessarily That's right. mine. I, I was going to answer that. Yeah, clearly. I mean, if okay. you're not tuning into our programs as they're happening, go to our YouTube channel because everything as it's happening, I mean, just within a few days of these events taking place, wind up on our YouTube channel. And if you don't know how to find that, you can either visit our website, okay, and then click on the YouTube box that's there, or just go to YouTube and type in MS Views and News in a search, and it'll bring it up there as well. We have well over a thousand videos on our YouTube channel, okay? And um, in the last year, I mean, we've got, we've, ha we've actually added over a hundred thousand new people looking at our channel since COVID began. So the answers are there. You go to youtube.com forward slash MS Views and News, forward slash, all right? That's the opposite of backslash. And, um, um, and, and, and like I said, or you go to our website or you go to YouTube itself and just type in MS Views and News, not News and Views, okay? All right. I think that's it, Dr. Williams. I know you got a house full to get out there and 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 take care of, all right, and get them off to bed or do their schoolwork or whatever else it is that you got to do. Everybody that's on here tonight, I really, really, really want to thank you for being here. Um, please remember again, this program was sponsored by Genentech, and um, and we're here to provide you answers. So come aboard our our upcoming programs. Find us on our on our website or blog or Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're on all of it, all right? And we're here to provide you information. And again, we can't do these programs without the 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 effects and the and the answers that we get from doctors such as Dr. Mitzi Williams. So thank, thank you everybody you. and thank you, Dr. Williams. Awesome. Always my pleasure. Thank you guys Namaste. so much. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs>